Right, uh, let's get going. I see a couple of people just joining. Excellent. Wait for them to get on camera and hello, welcome. Just in time, Richard, good to see you. Okay, right, uh, let's let's get going. Um, I think we're rolling with recording. So, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Re Results National Grassroots Conference call for April. Um, we're probably gonna have a lot more lines open this month uh, than usual, because obviously quite a few people are joining individually rather than in your groups. Um, so if we've got anybody new on the call this evening, a very warm welcome to you. Uh, my name is Aaron Oxley. I'm the Executive Director of Results UK. Uh, does anybody else um, want to say a quick hello or introduce themselves? No? All, all hello. Yep. Yep. Uh, hello. I'll, I'll say hello. Hi, Peter. <laughs> Hi, yeah, I'm, I'm calling from under the flight path at Stansted, which is suddenly very, very quiet and it's lovely. But you, yeah, you must be loving it, Peter. Oh, yeah. It makes the whole place like grow and we're, we're growing stuff in the garden now we're starting our kitchen garden going and uh yeah and i always work from home anyway so i don't give a toss <laughs> very good good to hear from you peter um uh i tell you what well let's let's kick on with the rest of the call oh hang on now we've got someone else saying hi uh, who was that Uh, okay, uh, let's let's jump ahead with the rest of the call. Um, so, uh, as I always do in these monthly calls, I'm going to start with a quick overview of what's going on in the world that affects our work here at Results to overcome global poverty. Uh, and it's not going to be so quick this week, I'm afraid, because everything is being affected by the coronavirus or COVID-19. Um, it's really obviously quite a very worrying time for all of us. And I just want to say that it's okay to be worried. That's a, a pretty rational response to what is actually a very difficult situation. But even through that worry, I want to start by saying that we're going to continue to stand with you. And I hope that you're all keeping really safe and that you and all of your loved ones are well. And results, uh, we're actually all feeling very lucky and very privileged. Just over three weeks ago now, all of our staff started working from home as a precautionary measure. Uh, right before the government guidance uh, suggested that we do. Um, we're really lucky because a lot of our work is able to continue. Of course, there are some things we can't do, but the vast majority of our policy, advocacy and campaigning work carries on with even more urgency than before. And we're so privileged to be able to continue to do it, even though the world's changed dramatically in the last few weeks. And of course, the advocacy that we're doing has also changed. I'm going to be giving a few updates about what that means for the issues that we're working on in just a minute. But most important thing is to start with keeping safe. The week before last, we sent out a copy of our monthly news flash email with details on how to keep in touch with us. And also a reminder to not put yourself at risk in any way while doing any advocacy on behalf of results. Now, of course, it's quite unlikely that you'll be getting a meeting with a politician anytime soon. And even paper leaders may not well reach their targets because of quarantine procedures put in place by the, their receivers. But if you're on this call, then you're lucky in that you have the technology that helps us communicate remotely and more. We're going to be exploring what this looks like with this month's guest speaker a little bit later on. But before we go into any of that, I wanted to give people on this call a chance to share any other personal reflections about the current situation. How are you doing? How are folks in your group, given you can't actually meet right now? Uh, I don't know if anybody wants to share anything. We've got, a WhatsApp. We've got a WhatsApp group and we just share stuff, Ask, check in with each other. Thanks, Jill. We, Was that set up specifically in the last couple of weeks or something you had going for a little while? Uh, no, it's, it's just, it, just in the last couple of weeks, I think. Am I right, Peter? I can't hear. <laughs> oh, Corinne, I, I see you speaking, Corinne. I can hear. Oh, yeah. I can hear. Oh, set it up. Sorry, yeah, it was the last couple of weeks we set it up. Uh, yeah. And it feels nice to be able to communicate that way, whereas before it was always email. Mm. Um, one thing I'm really aware of, uh, and I'm sure, I'm sorry, I missed the first few minutes, uh, is just when you hear the very occasional reports about overseas so for example the white helmets in Syria that it's making its way over there 
and you know how are they going to be prepared with the refugee camps and whatever and so I just think feel incredibly grateful that uh, and just concerned for those developing countries yeah I think that's a very rational response Corinne I mean we we are thinking about that a lot in the office we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, about that a little later on in the call um, but again that's a very that's a very sensible thing to be worried about the, the risks there are very high uh, I did notice that a couple of people have been saying in the chat while, while we've been talking too, around being able to set up your own personal Zoom line. Um, it's totally free uh, and being able to have calls like this um, with folks. It's actually uh, pretty straightforward in the tutorials and so on. You may have heard some warnings about Zoom not being as secure as you might like. Um, Zoom are fixing that rapidly. They're, they got caught a bit by surprise uh, by its increase in popularity. So I wouldn't worry too much about the security thing. They're, they're making a very serious effort to tidy up around the edges and, and lock it down properly. So, yeah. Good. How is this? How is this call protected? Is there are there any extra protections on this call, for example? Uh, I'm going to get Naveed to answer that one, I think, as I didn't or Della, because I didn't actually set it up. Um, we, no, we just you, if you've got the link, you can join. So we can monitor it, and if there's anyone um, kind of coming on who's making inappropriate uh, co comments or behaving inappropriately, we can remove them. But um, Technologically-wise, I can't really answer that, Dean. I'm sorry. Boo. Okay. Well, so uh, I think I think we're all adapting and learning pretty rapidly how we navigate this, the uh, the the new world we find, Aaron. Um, but I think one of the things that we all need to attend to most right now is to make sure that alongside our concern to keep everybody really that's closest to us safe we also are thinking about other people in other parts of the world um, as mentioned uh, just briefly earlier i mean everyone right now has exactly the same concerns about their loved ones as we do and showing solidarity with them is really more important now than ever um, COVID's made it really clear that while poor health anywhere in the world creates risks to everyone, it's more than that. I know that the people on this call understand that our common humanity requires us to be mindful of the needs of people wherever they are, even at times when risks to health and well-being are so close to home. Now, these ideas might be clear to us, but we have to be incredibly sensitive when we share them, especially when people in the UK are facing illness or family tragedies of their own but there really has never been a more important time to stand together as a global community. Now, it can feel like a time of fearfulness and hopelessness in the face of a hidden enemy that we can't control. But all good advocates, ultimately, we're not just optimists, we're practical people who look at what we control and we focus in on that. And indeed, that's the second part of our mission statement at Results, which is to empower individuals to exercise their own personal and political power for change. It speaks to exactly that. We all actually have far more influence and control than sometimes we think that we do. So we can continue to express our concern for people who are living in poverty and to put forward positive practical ideas that our government can implement. This is essentially a story of hope that even when things are darkest there are things that we can achieve and we should keep aiming for. Just as we see health workers and others delivering essential services doing practical things to support others. The American president, Theodore Roosevelt, was a pretty quotable, quotable person. And while most people have probably heard his very famous words on the man in the arena, which is from a brilliant speech, and one we'll put a link to the chat, chat box, I actually wanted to share a much shorter Roosevelt quote tonight. He said, do what you can with what you have where you are. And I mean, to me, that's just so relevant to this great crisis in our own time, for it reminds us that we all have something that we can do right now that will make a difference. We don't need to be overwhelmed by the size of the challenges. And because you're here, you're already aware of our interdependence as human beings and the need to speak out in solidarity with people facing illness and death, health workers, those who've lost their jobs, and many others just struggling to do their best in the face of fear and adversity, both in less developed countries and also right here in our own doorsteps. 
And so what we do tonight is part of standing with all of those people. Now, with the pandemic having a, a truly profound effect on all the things we care about, let me just give you a few immediate updates on the most significant things of these for our advocacy work at Results. Obviously, a lot of international meetings where we hope to have influence have been cancelled or postponed. One of them uh, was to be around the Summer Olympics, now delayed by a year, where the Japanese government was planning to host a meeting about nutrition that was to be a chance for donor countries to pledge new money in the fight against malnutrition. That isn't happening now, but in that we're actively looking at other opportunities for the UK to pledge new resources to nutrition. As many of you know, our current commitments expire at the end of this year. We know that poor food security and malnutrition make people far more vulnerable to diseases, so this issue simply can't be put on hold while we wait to get the COVID pandemic under control. Obviously, climate change continues to put people at risk of food insecurity and, ad and inadequate nutrition. And we've heard that the U next UN conference on climate change, which was to have been held in Glasgow later this year, has also been postponed. One other thing we've started to talk about this year are the linkages between education and climate change through our work with the Send, to Friend, Send My Friend to School campaign. At least 383 million children across the UK and around the world aren't able to go to school right now. And Send My Friend is adapting its teachers' materials and planning online so that children at home can still take part. We also know that you can't benefit from an education if you aren't healthy, and there's a useful statement on their website around the impact of COVID on education. We're going to put a link to that in the chat box too. Next, and perhaps most directly, we're seeing the impact of COVID on health systems around the world. Even relatively strong health systems such as our NHS are struggling to cope, let alone weaker health systems in many poorer countries. We're hearing serious concerns about how these countries are going to be unable to respond effectively to the crisis. And in a lot of countries, specific health provisions such as TB services, polio vaccination and other routine vaccinations are at risk. These activities are being put on hold or else resources are being diverted away from them and into the COVID response. Now, while this might be necessary in the short term, we must realize that this means more people will die or suffer from these ongoing, less well-publicized health emergencies. And so we have to advocate for COVID response to be in addition to, and not instead of ongoing efforts, just the same way they are here in the UK. On vaccinations, many of you will know that we've been hopeful that the UK government will very soon be making a big financial pledge to Gavi the Vaccine Alliance to cover the period 2021 to 2025. Again, we believe the government's still very supportive, but this is obviously a pretty difficult time politically to be making big public financial commitments. We're keeping a really close eye on this. A really big thank you for all the work you've been doing on this issue, and we're really hopeful that our campaigning will very soon bear fruit with a commitment. In light of all of this, our action this month is to ask the UK government to do all it can to show solidarity with other countries who are facing the same and even greater challenges to the ones we face here in the UK. We're obviously aware that the UK is incredibly busy dealing with the biggest risk to the public here that we've faced in peacetime. And so rather than going into depth about any of these specific challenges, we're suggesting that you take an encouraging tone. And if you feel you can, thank them for doing all they can to keep the public safe but also raise your concern that our response needs to include helping poorer countries to deal with the global pandemic. The government can do that by supporting them to strengthen those governments' health systems, to be more resilient to both this and future disease outbreaks. But do not forget that this health system strengthening will also help realize the ambition of the global goals to achieve health for all by 2030. That's an ambition that's made much harder by pandemics like COVID. And lastly, I really would like to recommend everyone reads today's long read in The Guardian by Rebecca Solnit. She knows a thing or two about hope in dark times that leads to action and change. Do take a read and thank you for being here tonight to do exactly those things. Um, that's all I wanna say right now. I'm gonna hand over to Della for the usual roundup of all your advocacy activities around the UK in the last month. Over to you, Della. Thanks, Aaron. Nice to see you all tonight. Um, I just wanted to start with an update on last month's campaign action um, and say thanks to so many of you for writing to Alok Sharma and asking him to maintain um, the UK's commitment to R&D funding to NTB. It was really nice to read all your letters, they were all incredible and it made um, a really technical ask come to life I think, seeing what you'd written, um, so thanks a lot. 
I know the London group managed to meet up and post their letters together before the lockdown happened, which was great. So hopefully those, those letters got through. Um, so Sidonia Brighton actually shared with me the first response I've seen from Bayes, which is the department responsible for R&D funding. So I thought I'd just tell you about it because I don't know if you might be receiving similar ones or if you haven't, um, I thought I'd, I'd share anyway. Um, so their response notes that the government is firmly committed to becoming a global science superpower in their words and supporting UK research and development and that they are ready to consider participation in Horizon Europe in the same way that other non-EU states like Switzerland currently do. Um, the terms of exactly what Horizon Europe is going to look like are being renegotiated at EU level at the moment and we think that a strong willingness and interest from the UK to remain a key player at this stage will actually help influence what the final terms of association for Horizon look like. Um, both my colleagues working on TB agree that the tone of the letter was really positive and encouraging, um, more so than what they'd previously heard from the government's public correspondence. Um, so for now, we're going to wait and see if the government formally includes their position on joining Horizon Europe in their EU negotiations, which will wrap up in the second half of this year. Um, so please be reassured that your letters have made an impact by nudging the government to prioritise doing this. Um, yeah, uh, if you've got any more questions, just drop me an email. If you've been getting any different responses, it would be great to see them as well. Um, also, thanks to everyone who's been forwarding me responses from the Minister for International Development, Wendy Morton, on the Gavi replenishment. Um, they've all been really positive responses and it's really good to see DFID reassure us that they are committed to, um, to Gabby's fifth replenishment and it's nice to see them mention as well that they're, that they're looking to um, support countries that might be growing to, to reach the threshold of support um, so that they're able to maintain sustainable health systems with more of their own domestic resources. Um, Oh, are you having problems with sound? Oh, okay. Everyone else can hear me. Hopefully, um, hopefully, Nikki, it's sounding a bit better for you. I'll try and speak slowly. Um, I also just wanted to thank um, members of the Brighton group who've both written blogs inspired by sessions we ran at the training in March, um, which looked at the interconnectedness of the results policy issues that we work on. The first of which was from Eleanor for World TV Day and the second was from Georgia and looks at the links between education and climate change, which Aaron touched on. Um, I'll put a link to both those blogs in the chat box so you can have a read. And also, if you don't already follow the Brighton group on Twitter, I'd recommend it. They've been really active and it's looking really good at the moment, so I'll post a link. Um, on World TB Day as well, we hosted a webinar with the amazing guest speaker, Soelle was a Fumba, who is a South Africa based doctor, TB survivor and advocate. Um, and it was really nice to see some of you on the call. Apologies, the sound wasn't great. We've sorted it out in the call recording and I'll post a link uh, so that you can watch it back if you missed it. Um, finally on TB, we had a kind of last minute action that you could take, which was to ask your MP to sign on to an early day motion, which is like a statement of support uh, for ending TB. So if, if you still want to ask your MP to do that, I'll put a link in there so you can do that. Um, and very lastly, you may have seen that the Labour Party's new leader, Keir Starmer, has announced who his shadow team will be. Um, and it includes some of our network's MPs. So um, the Birmingham Group's MP, Preet Gill, is now the Shadow Secretary of State for International Development. And Oxford's MP, Annelise Dodds, is the Shadow Chancellor, which means they will likely be slightly more influential than they were before. Um, so I look forward to seeing how the group's relationship develop there, develops there. Um, yeah, I'm happy to chat with you both about that if, um, if you want more info. I think that's it from me. Um, as usual, let me know if you've been taking other actions that we don't know about or you've been getting any responses back from government or MPs. Um, and you can always drop me an email with any questions you have or to let me know if you're finding the calls useful and all the other communications that we put out. So yeah, that's it for me. Back to you, Aaron. Thanks so much, Della. Now, now onto the top of tonight's call. Uh, it's my pleasure once again to introduce another results colleague, 
Uh, I know we've had a few in recent calls, but I think that's really testament to how much phenomenal advocacy expertise results has around the world. Um, this month, our colleague Lisa Marshall, who's the Grassroots Impact Manager for Results in the USA, is joining us. She's going to share her experience of helping campaigners continue to make a difference at this difficult time. Uh, what does it mean for the way they organise, communicate, conduct their advocacy? And let's face it, there's now more need to advocate than ever before. Lisa, uh, I saw you earlier. Uh, do you want to say hi. hi? Maybe There you are. Hi, I'm here. <laughs> Great. So glad you're on the call. Um, a big welcome to you. I think it's three in the afternoon where you are. So a very big thank you for taking time out of your working day to be with us. Um, I don't think you need much of an introduction to our grassroots network as the US network is similar to our own. It's maybe a little mm -hmm. bit bigger, um, but I know you're in regular contact with Naveed and Dell to scheme together. Um, but just so you know, we're joined tonight by passionate folks all the way up in Scotland, right down to the south coast and many places in between. Um, in a minute, I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself. But first, I wonder if I can ask how all of our results colleagues in the US are doing. I'm sure you're being affected by the situation just as we are here in the UK. We, we definitely are. Um, I mean, it, it, it varies state by state what's happening in terms of protocols, but um, there is a sense of lockdown um, and uh, broadly around the country. But um, so far we're, we're doing a good job, I think, of checking in with one another and we're standing strong. So thank you for that. Thanks, Lisa. I mean, really, please do pass on our best wishes to everyone in the US. We really do stand together with you. Um, now, I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself briefly and your role, what it is that you do, uh, and say what it is that brought you into this work. Um, what that motivates you to work to support people across the US to contact their lawmakers and local media about global poverty? What, what gets you out of bed in the morning? Ah, okay. Well, um, well, it is my pleasure to be to be with you. Um, I uh, years ago I studied for a while in London and um, did a uh, an internship in London as well. And so it makes me by no means an expert uh, on, on the whole of everyone that's represented here, all the places that are represented. But um, I have a strong place in my heart for you all, and I am one of two grassroots impact managers for Results US. And I happen to be one of the staff members that does not live in Washington, DC. There are about 10 of us who do not. And so I work from Indianapolis. Um, if anybody knows Indianapolis, they know it because they know the Indianapolis 500 IndyCar racing. So that race is run here. So if you're an IndyCar person. Um, what got me into this work, actually, I had a someone who was close to my family um, who developed AIDS in the late 80s. And that was a time when there was not a strong public health campaign around AIDS. There was limited um, knowledge about transmission, about the disease itself. Um, I was school age, and this family friend um, developed AIDS, died of um, AIDS-related complications, and I didn't know it at the time, but that experience kind of lit a bit of a pilot light in me that stayed quietly burning for a while. And I, um, full disclosure, my, my uh, previous work and my current credentialing is actually um, in the United Methodist Church. Um, we would say a pastor here, probably a vicar there. And I worked in local churches, but I became more and more interested in what was happening with um, people of faith and public policy. And I knew that my strength was not necessarily in public policy, but it was in the, I want to do something about this kind of feeling. That's really where where I connected. And so circumstances had it that I was able to intersect with results about the time that the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, TB, and Malaria was being born. And that 
that aligned right with my passion around um, the stemming of HIV AIDS. And then, you know, subsequently I was able to learn about how global health and marginalized communities, how those things collide and how it collides with poverty, that whole matrix. So that's really what's drawn me into this work. Thanks, Lisa. Um, it, it's always uh, really powerful to hear what it is that uh, that has drawn people to this work um, and really the, the very personal thing that gets you to be a part of this advocacy mission. Um, and it's, it's also really interesting to see how so much of that is the same all around the world. Um, and certainly for me, um, it really helps show how our advocacy here in the UK is part of a much bigger picture of coordinated efforts on the issues that we care about right across the planet. So look, um, let's jump in. Um, we'll be ta start by taking uh, a couple of uh, our usual pre-arranged questions for Lisa to get the ball rolling before we open it up to the floor. Um, uh, pretty much everybody is on the Zoom tonight rather than on the phones, uh, but just in case, for the, anybody that doesn't want to use or hasn't figured out how to use the chat box to ask a question, um, or doesn't want to unmute themselves and ask a question when we get to that stage, you can text in a number. Um, the number is the same as uh, last month. It's 0777 56 178. That's 0777 56 178. Uh, now we are going to jump across to Paul, I believe, for our first question. Which of the multitude of Paulites -pool uh, is going to be asking the questions? It's, it's Helen from Paul. Go ahead, Helen. Okay. Um, Lisa, hello. Welcome to Results. Um, we'd like to know how results groups in the United States have been reacting to the COVID crisis, please. Yes, well, um, you know, first when it came across our radar, we, uh, we as a staff started all working remotely, which for about 10 of us was not much upheaval because we were already working remotely, but our whole staff needed to do the very same thing that your staff has done. And our recommendation, just like from your staff, went out saying, saying to volunteers not to meet in person. But in terms of the spirit of things, um, our volunteers really have reacted with, I think, resilience and focus and real compassion. There's been a sense of, yes, we are about the protection of our own families and communities, and that's as it should be, but not at the expense of the protection of others, the protection of it, those in marginalized communities, um, the protection of the vulnerable. And one of our veteran volunteers said, you know, we're really kind of made for this moment. She said, we're, we're trained to advocate across time and distance because our, our policymakers live and work in Washington, DC and other than the staff, most, most volunteers don't live and work there. So we've had to build these remote connections. Um, even the staff that work within a given state tend to specialize in constituent services and local services. They're not specializing in the things that we're working on. So we've got to make connections with the DC, the Washington DC offices. So we're used to the technology by and large, we're used to doing things remotely by and large. We've had to get used to the social distancing, which has made us um, um, a little disoriented, quite frankly, and, and not so happy. But one of the things that we've done, a colleague of mine, another grassroots manager, my colleague, Joss Lynn, he had the great idea. He said, you know, whenever we have a constituency group that comes together, why don't we broaden that call? okay, this is a group leader call that's coming together, but would any members of that group leaders group want to come? Just a sense of getting people out of the isolation and um, standing in solidarity. So we're doing okay. Thanks, Lisa. Um, that's good to hear. That's really good to hear. 
Um, uh, I like the term resilience, solidarity, uh, compassion. They're all, they're all really, really powerful. Um, we are going to go to Sheffield for question number two. We are okay. seeing the COVID crisis offering, affecting people right across the world in developing and developed countries. How do you see the importance of showing solidarity with each other? Yeah, thanks for that question. Uh, it's critically important. Um, Aaron spoke to this in his comments that we have to remember that when we have a health crisis, that crisis can very easily have an outsized impact on marginalized communities, vulnerable communities. And that's something that we're passionate about preventing. Um, we also talk a lot at results about equity. And my colleague, John Fawcett, he once described equity as, okay, resources are being distributed down the long paved road. And you've got to remember that there are folks that live beyond the end of the paved road. And so how are those resources being, being equally distributed and, um, You'll pardon my reference, but I love the band U2. I know that's a cliched thing, but one of their lyrics says, where you live should not decide whether you live or whether you die. And that's what I think about with equity is it really, um, we all need to have access to the resources that we've got to have for healthy quality of life. And um, so I think the solidarity is not just ethical, but it's, it's pragmatic. And we have to remember that we're all interconnected. Thanks, Lisa. I mean, I think that's a, that's a great segue into our next question, because I think, you know, one of the things that we really care deeply about at Results is about how we can speak respectfully uh, about issues of poverty and about um, the circumstances that people living in poverty find themselves. I think you, you heard in my opening remarks that, you know, speaking about COVID and about international development at a time when uh, communities at home are also under huge amounts of stress and again, affecting uh, marginalized communities uh, and, uh, much more uh, and, and much harder. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, that's a really great segue into our third question, which is coming to us from Brighton. Hiya, yeah. um, I'm Sidoni from Brighton. Um, I just wanted to ask, can you suggest some ways in which it's helpful or unhelpful to talk about COVID in relation to poverty and the issues that results work on, please? Yes, my colleague Colin Smith um, has written a lot about this and has talked about not only framings, but phrases that don't necessarily serve us very well. And um, he talks about do's and don'ts. And one of the things he, do, he talks about doing is putting marginalized communities at the center when you're writing and speaking. And so he gives an example of what this could look like. You might say, with coronavirus or any pandemic, we know it's the communities experiencing poverty and already pushed to the margins that face the greatest risks. Viruses don't discriminate but people and policies too often do. So putting them at the center rather than as an afterthought. Um, he, he talks about making uh, connections between our ongoing poverty issues and the pandemic rather than pitting them against each other, drawing the similarities um, and the correlations. So he gives an example what this might look like. Access to basic needs like nutrition, and affordable housing are even more important and even more endangered in a crisis. And whether it's coronavirus or another ongoing global health emergency, we need strong global health care delivery systems, international partnerships, and a respect for human rights. A commitment to equity needs to drive the policy response to this pandemic. So making sure that, um, that you, we don't, we don't forget that um, when we're working on the issues that we work on, we are helping uh, 
the issue of the pandemic. Another thing he, he talks about, and I'll be very happy to share this with you. Colin has very neatly put this together in a, in a tidy blog post. So if you want to reference it, we will have it at your fingertips. But another warning that he has is on um, xenophobia and how that can creep in. And we start othering people. We start um, scapegoating. We start blaming. And this is you know, ab absolutely a harmful framework, just like language that talks about carriers or infecting others or spreading the virus that's done in kind of a, um, a well, I think you're probably getting the point. It, it's not done in a really um, positive looking way. It's looking, it's kind of got a blaming connotation to it. And we want to really avoid that. Um, finally, I would say uh, we have to be very careful not to focus on how this benefits us that it's, it's not an, it should not be an afterthought that the policies that we put in place benefit those who are the most vulnerable. That actually should be front and center in our minds. And so we don't wanna be focused on what the right thing to do for us is, but we wanna be focused on what the right thing to do is. So um, if my colleagues haven't already put it in the chat box, I'll be happy to share uh, the blog. You can easily find these hooks um, if you go to our website, results.org backslash coronavirus. You can then from there find the blog post that illuminates all of these and gives kind of language examples that you can play off of. Thanks, Lisa. I mean, that's just, that's just critically important. And I think, you know, we're, we are, we, as results as we're all, um, constantly challenged to make sure that we're using the right language. Uh, it's our bread and butter of, uh, in trade of, of how we communicate and how we can be effective in communicating. And it's time to double down on those sensitivities and uh, uh, so on. So uh, I am going to now uh, open the, the call to uh, everybody to ask questions. Um, I'm uh, so much has been flying through the chat box. I'm afraid I haven't been able to keep up. So if there are any questions in there, I haven't quite, um, I, I haven't quite spotted them. Uh, besides, can we have the quotes written down and all the links going up on the blog to which the answer is yes, absolutely. We always make sure the links will be part of the blog post that contains the recording for tonight. Um, does anybody have any questions for Lisa? Oh, hang on, I should also check to see if any have come on the, on the chat. Yeah, Pete here, Stuart Valley. Please, Peter, go ahead. Yeah, Lisa, you mentioned uh, not casting blame on others, um, which says to me that the issue has arisen in the network. Um, can you expand on that, please? How has that become a feature of our advocacy, or at least the advocacy in the United States. Thank you. Oh, interesting. Yes, um, we haven't had anything kind of uh, any sort of a flashpoint of that over here, but uh, Colin very, very smartly kind of anticipated that it can be human nature for that to creep in to um, our, some of our framing, in, especially in a time like this. And so actually it was just a preemptive comment that he made um, and, and suggestions that he made to not get into that, that kind of othering framing. Um, we may have seen it when we've tackled other, um, other topics, but there wasn't, it was not necessarily a flashpoint for this. He kind of got out a little bit ahead of it. Um, okay, thank you. Yes, sure. Um. Thanks for that, Lisa. We've got uh, a, a few. We've got a few questions flowing through the chat box now, which I think are quite good. Um, let's give you a nice, easy one, though. Um, <laughs> what What's happening with the international conference? What's happening? With, is that supposed to be an easy one, Aaron? <laughs> well, just uh, you know. <laughs> <I'm teasing. laughs> okay, go ahead. Okay. I'm teasing. No, we are going to go virtual, which is the way of it these days, right? Um, so what we're hoping to do is, um, and you can go to results.org back, no wait, that's wrong, resultsconference.org, 
that should be right, resultsconference.org. And um, you can see that we've got um, a couple of dates of placeholders. What we're hoping to do is have, have a couple of days of programming across the original dates, the 20th and the 21st, which would be that weekend. And then um, we're thinking about what could we expand? Uh, how could we do perhaps a week of action where we could draw out some of our lobbying work? We could draw out you know, the lobby preparation, the lobbying work, um, and have a little bit more of a chance to involve people because that's the flip side of going virtual is that we may have people join at least parts of the conference that would never have been able to join before because of travel. So we're excited about that possibility. So you could kind of place hold the 20th and 21st as maybe content days and then a kind of week of action um, special moments for that following week. And that's June 20th, Start the start of that is June 20th, and then a week on. And, and are, you just, looking, are you looking at, at having uh, lobbying actual Capitol Hill Zooming with congressmen and heads of IMF and the World Bank and stuff? We've, we've dipped our toes into that preliminarily. We've started doing trainings with our volunteers on how to do virtual lobby meetings with our members of Congress. So we're dipping our toes into that water. And um, again, our folks, when they lobby with members of Congress and their staff in DC, they're having to do that remotely anyway. But we're trying to see if they if they might incorporate some extra technology that might enhance their meetings. You don't have to though. You could do a plain old fashioned phone conference call. And some, for some folks, that's still a new concept. Thank you. Sure. Um, could I just ask a follow up question? Uh, what would the time difference be for those two dates? So assuming it was on U.S time uh what time would that be here if there were virtual zoom calls going on I, I can answer that one i do this a lot um it's actually really good timing um it basically if they've got a 9 a.m start and i guess americans are quite get up and go sometimes they start even earlier at eight so let's say the americans start at eight um that's that's going to be one in the afternoon here so you get to have a bit of a lie-in <laughs> and then if you want, you can go from about one in the afternoon till about nine or 10 o'clock at night um, if you wanted to follow the entirety of a, of a long conference day. Uh, and when they all head off to do their karaoke in the evening, which does happen at some international conferences, I'm afraid that's probably when we're going to be going to bed. <laughs> Does that sound about right, Lisa? That sounds about right. <laughs> so yeah, it should be, it should be very very possible to engage, particularly with anything that's going on in the morning. I'm really excited yeah. about the possibility. So that's, yeah, good. that's a really good question. Yeah, and we're going to try to remain as sensitive as we can to all of the various time zones. There won't be anything perfect, but again, this virtual format gives us flexibility and variety possibilities that we didn't have before. Great. Um, let's go to another question that's, that's come into the chat. Um, um, it was from Jill. Um, it's, she says, is it, is it worth engaging with Facebook posts from friends who say things like, we should be giving development money to solve COVID at home instead of overseas? Is that best ignored? Oh. That's, that's the question. Yes. Um, I wish I had my social media colleague on here. I can tell you, as far as best practices, we don't necessarily primarily engage in social media. We use it as an amplifier rather than as a primary tool. So we try, because what's happening here in the United States is um, print journalism is still in jeopardy. I don't know what the state of play is over there. Print journalism is in jeopardy over here. And if a print paper is still up and running, it means it has a readership. And so, we try to get into print and then amplify our message out into social media. So it means really that we're trying to push our own content rather than reacting to content that's already out there. So I might make that suggestion that, that 
that space, those spaces are going to get filled with content. Put, push out your positive content rather than getting into a reactionary kind of mode with any other content that's out there. Um, and you can, you're, you're going to be responding to what's in the community, but you're going to be putting your own framing and your own messaging rather than reacting to others. Lisa, that's actually very smart. I've never heard that that uh, response quite that that same articulated in quite that same way. Um, it's a it's quite a fancy way of saying don't feed the trolls. I guess uh, you know focus on the positive messages that you have and put those out there, which I really like. That's that's really smart. Can you Thank can you. you put it in your own words? In in in, Aaron, how would you how would you coach us in dealing with social media? conversations because we do have conversations all the time mm. go ahead Aaron well so uh, I'm, I'm probably the the worst person you could possibly ask to answer that question in the sense that I deleted my Facebook account quite some time ago um, and I really only use Twitter to push out uh, exactly the kind of messages that Lisa Lisa was talking about in terms of things that I want other people to know because I think they're important uh, and and that I would love other people to act on. Um, so my 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 general approach to engaging an online debate with people that hold fundamentally different views to me is to try really hard not not to engage publicly, uh, which I don't think is running away. Um, I, I genuinely don't think that because you know I I don't the number of people that have had strongly held views that were changed because somebody chatted at them over Facebook. Um, you know, I don't think that's a very big group of people. Um, and so, you know, I think, you know, you guys all know from your daily lives and from the advocacy work that you've done um, in your communities and with your elected representatives and through other, the other channels, you know, you know how to change people's minds when you have the chance to sit down with them face to face as human beings and have a, a reasonable conversation where you can bring evidence and have respectful conversation and argument. And that's just really hard to do over Facebook uh, or any other digital medium. Um, study after study shows the level of discourse plummets towards the floor um, and, and civility does too. And that, that can be quite a traumatic experience, which is part of why I avoid it because I want to keep my energy for the things that uh, I know are going to be effective and w where I need to put it. So I, I, that's why, you know, I, I would, uh, yeah, that, that, that would be my answer. Uh, and maybe it's not super helpful, but that's how I stay sane and can stay in action. Can okay, I, 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 just, I, I just want to say, I just want to say as a footnote to that, Aaron, is that I, I consider social media to be absolutely vital because I inhabit the community and the various communities, and this is a community conversation. So I'll just leave it there. Um, and speaking on behalf of a community voice, we have to deal with the community rather than stand aloof. Can I just add to this that actually there is a thing called the Aid Ninjas, which is organized by, I think, the One Campaign ran the last training session. Um, and they've been running sessions sort of twice a year on exactly this topic, how to engage in online discussions um, in defense of UK aid, um, if you want to. Um, and I don't know when the next one is planned for, but as soon as I know, I'll share that information with you. It could be that it's an online session. Because it sounds like there's definitely appetite for it, so I'll make sure to to point you in the right direction when that's available. Thank you, Della. Great. And of course, my response and the way I do it is not the same thing that everybody needs to or should do. We all do the things we can with what we have, where we are. Um, so, okay, uh, on to some more questions. Um, let's go looking at, through some of those. So. Um, uh, this is one from Hunter, um, the 848 question, if you're following along, Lisa. On the international conference, how does it work when we're targeting different people and different systems of power, like the American presidency works slightly differently to our Downing Street? I think that's an understatement of the century. Um, so I'm just wondering where the aim is placed and how it works. Yes, well, um, what we've done in an in-person international conference is actually twofold. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, Aaron, because I'm always with the United States volunteers. But the way that we do it is our United States volunteers 
go to their own senators and their own representatives. So they book meetings there. The, the folks that have come from, um, from outside the United States often get to go to the World Bank meetings, but not, that's not always required. Uh, that's not always the state of play for, for everyone during the day that we go to what we call the Hill, which is uh, Congress, where the senators and the representatives are. So those folks that do not need to go to World Bank meetings, sometimes we have them as guests. They're part of a delegation that goes to various states. So for example, um, the state I live in, in Indiana, we for many years actually had um, folks from Results UK accompany us and they are part of our delegation and we try to make sure that they have a role that they can play in the meeting. But if they want to just quietly observe, they can. But if they want to contribute from their own pool of knowledge so that we just have a more robust conversation, then they've been able to do that as well. So that's the way that we, um, that's the way that it's varied a little bit um, historically. It'll be interesting. We're gonna have to think through what that's gonna look like this year and how we're gonna work that. Um, but that's historically what it's looked like. Thanks, Lisa. Couple of other, we've only got five or six minutes left. So I think we're gonna try and tackle some of the more difficult questions. Um, one is in here, uh, a couple of people uh, expressing concern uh, about how can we advocate for those abroad um, uh, in our communities and with our elected representatives when, you know, people are very rightly concerned, very concerned for their parents, their vulnerable neighbours. Um, that's a pretty tough ask, isn't it, to ask people to also care about people that live thousands of kilometres away. Mm or even miles. <laughs> <laughs> or even miles. Showing where I'm born, goodness. No, <laughs> um, it, it, is a, it is quite a thing, but we're, we're finding that our volunteers are able to hold that tension. Um, part of that is just, we're trying to be sensitive to one another as people and, make, and check in and make sure that folks are um, doing okay. Now we, we advocate um, at Results US on both domestic issues and on global issues. And so part of the way that folks can play out their concern is to advocate on our domestic spending around this pandemic. So they can take those kinds of actions. Um, but that sensitivity to how people are doing, who needs extra support, who needs space, I think is really, really very, very important. Um, but we're finding that also folks that are, their, their schedules have been disrupted. Maybe they have a little bit more time than they had before. Maybe they have um, more time when they're on their own than they had before. And they're hungry to do something with that energy. And so after they've checked on their immediate communities, after they've maybe taken that domestic spending action, they're wanting to take the global action because they understand that marginalized communities could bear the brunt of this pandemic. So that's kind of what, how we've seen it play out here in the United States. Thanks, Lisa, that's really helpful. A um, Couple of related questions came through on the chat uh, while, we were, uh, while we were talking. Um, uh, and that's, of course, my sister sending me a message just even after I told her. Never mind. Um, right. So uh, coming through on the chat, uh, we've got um, um, a couple of people talking, um, Emily and, and Larissa, talking about the challenges that we have as results, given the issues that we work on and how they're going to be disrupted by COVID. Um, Emily's question, I've been thinking about COVID uh, and people without access to running water, housing, internet, telephone. But can we comment on how this relationship between the public and the state uh, is affected by COVID or affects COVID? And also, are there COVID-19 specific things that results could be advocating for? This is from Larissa. Or is it better to focus on the existing problems that might get neglected now? Um, I know you can't answer all of those questions, Lisa, but maybe a couple of thoughts. I might add a couple and then we can uh, look at rounding out the call. Um. 
Yes. Well, one of the things that we've been talking about, and then I, I definitely want you to speak to your um, experiences and, and how you're framing uh, your advocacy right now for the UK. Um, one of the things that we've been talking about, um, we have things that we're working on. We have our two chambers. We have the House and the Senate. And um, right now we're in the midst of doing a lot of advocacy with the Senate because we did a lot of advocacy with the House earlier in the year because that was just the sequence of what we were working on. But we have folks who are saying, you know, we really still want to give a message to everybody in this COVID context. What are some things that we can be saying back to our House members? Um, because they're still paying attention, obviously, to what's going on. And we're talking about, you know, the, some of the things that, that we brought up in, um, in, our, in our framing conversation about how to write about these issues, that we need money to fight the pandemic. We need money to um, be, be there so that there aren't these knock-on effects that if, we, if we're looking to the right, things get neglected to the left. We don't want that to happen. We want there to be sustained funding for the kinds of things that we know work that prevent other diseases and other poverty-related problems um, from happening. So we don't wanna take our eye off of that ball, even though we are rightly focused on um, COVID-related spending. And then um, an, another piece that, that, we, um, that we look at is what are the, some of the non-health related things that are going on as a result of COVID? How many kids are out of school right now? And it's making it an unsafe, uh, an even more unsafe situation for them. So we've got to support funding around those things as well and still, still pay attention. So, it's a, it's a broad landscape that we've got to keep our eye on, but it's all interrelated. Thanks, Lisa. And just to, to maybe bring this back to the stuff that Results UK works on, um, if you were around last summer, you would have heard us banging on quite a lot about uh, the report that we prepared uh, called Brick by Brick, where we were looking at how all the different, the very different things that we all talk about individually within health will add up to more than the sum of the parts. Um, we've kicked off a process to update that report and look at how brick by brick now translates into a COVID and post-COVID world in terms of what this means for health systems and how can the Global Fund and Gavi and the polio eradication program and supporting health workers and making sure that we've got good, um, uh, good procurement and supply lines for drugs and so on how all of that can add up to making things um, after the COVID crisis subsides even better. And I, can, I could talk for a whole nother hour about each of those things and how they're interrelated. So look uh, in the coming days and weeks for things going out on our blog, for policy papers being published and others that start to get into some of those specificities. And the answer to the question, do we do one or the other? Uh, uh, you know, we're results. Uh, if, the, if the US government can find $2 trillion uh, to fight COVID at home, if the UK government can spend about 15%, one five percent of our GDP on fighting COVID here, we can certainly find enough money to put a little bit more money in the hat uh, for the international development response for COVID to be above and beyond business as usual. Um, to round out, uh, and I'm afraid we are going to have to finish up, but I'll just to very quickly address a couple of the questions around 0 0.7. Um, 0 0.7, um, will it be worth less? Uh, yes, it may well be worth less if our economy contracts. So DFID may well end up be facing uh, cuts in the future. Um, so we're going to have to keep our eye on that. And I think, you know, to be responsible, I think, you know, 0.7 is 0 0.7. We've always said it was a ratio and if it goes down, it goes down and we'll figure out the best way to manage that decline so that the programs that we need to have protected stay protected. Um, there are plenty of advocacy uh, energy around the world um, ha has been has done that in other contexts. So we're, we're, we're ready for that. We're, we're, we're planning for it. Uh, is it enough to make a difference? Yes. It's absolutely enough to make a difference. 0.7% is not $2 trillion or 15%. 
but I can tell you it absolutely will make a difference. Some of the things that we're seeing that countries are needing right now don't have to be that expensive and will make a, a really, really powerful uh, impact on the ground. So never fear, um, our, our aid money will be effective. Um, I'm really, really sorry if anybody's got any other questions or anything like that that we haven't answered, we'll make sure that we scan through that when we put up the blog post and try and get those answered for you. Um, but we've, we've run out of time. Um, and may I, and may I say, I was remiss in saying at the beginning, we are of course thinking of you all. Um, and, um, I've been watching your news, um, and know what's going on. And so, um, our hearts go right back to you all and we're just in this together. So I just wanted to say that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Really? And likewise, likewise. Um, I, I'm really sorry, but we are, we are four minutes past and I really do have to wrap things up tonight. I know we could talk for a lot longer and I've seen a bunch of stuff in the chat saying exactly what you want to talk about and how we could set that up. I'll talk to Naveed and Della and see if we can figure out another time for that very soon. Um, but we have come to the end of our time together tonight. I want to say a big, big thank you to Lisa for sharing her experiences from America with us. Um, please. It's my pleasure. All of our best wishes for the safety and the work of the US Grassroots Network over the coming weeks and months, because together we've got a really big and important job to do. Um, thanks to everyone who's joined this call for so showing exceptional commitment to the cause of global poverty and international solidarity at a time when we're all feeling vulnerable here at home. Um, if you're able to take this month's advocacy action, which is to encourage the new Secretary of State, another new Secretary of State for International Development, Anne-Marie Trevelyan, um, to put all of that solidarity into practice, so that the UK continues and increases its considerable support for resilient health systems in poorer countries, that'd be great. Um, together we can be better, not just at resisting new diseases such as COVID, but also all of the existing health emergencies that we are going to continue to work on too. Before I go, one very last thing, just why we're asking you to write group letters tonight. It's not random, there's two specific reasons. One is that in writing a group letter, we give you an excuse to get back on a Zoom call, get reconnected to each other, carry on the conversation, which we think is really important right now. And second of all, with slightly fewer letters numerically heading into what who are quite busy, quite stretched civil servants, I think they're going to appreciate that um, and they will be able to write better responses in, re in, in, in reply um, without having to write quite so many, which I think will be nice for them and will be good. So look, I've really enjoyed this evening's call. I hope you all have as well. Good luck with all your advocacy actions. Please do keep safe and healthy. I'll speak to you all on the next grassroots conference call, if not before, and it looks like we might have to speak before then, but that will be on the evening of Tuesday, the 5th of March. Mark your diaries. Yay. Good night from me. Enjoy the rest of your evening and take care, everybody. Bye. 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 everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Navid. Bye. Good to see you. Yeah, me too. Bye.